it, it is wonderful to be here, to, to meet new folks, to meet new, new brethren, to meet new brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I appreciate your interest in the gospel. There are a lot of things that you could be doing on a Friday night, and that you are here is a good thing. And I pray the things that we study tonight will be a blessing to you. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. I'm thankful to the congregation here. I'm thankful to the elders here for this opportunity to come and speak tonight and Saturday night and as well as Sunday morning. To go ahead and get into the lesson, I'd like to begin with a question. What are some of the pivotal moments in Scripture? How would you answer that question? I think there's a number of them, frankly. And I think, you know, just start at the beginning, might as well, and we might think about the garden. That was a pivotal moment as we think about the things that happened. As they sinned, as we think about the consequences of their sin, as we think about the consequences to all mankind. We're not talking about total depravity like is often thought of, but we're thinking about being separated from the tree of life. We're thinking about looking forward to what Revelation speaks about, being once again with the Lord in heaven. You might think about that as you have the picture of the tree of life again in Revelation. It's a pivotal moment. We might think about the flood as God judged the world. And we think about how the flood is used throughout Scripture and how the flood pointed to a time when the world is once again going to, dis the Lord is going to destroy the world. That while the Lord is long-suffering and is merciful, at the same time, the, the Lord is just. And so we recognize that. So because of these things, what manner of persons ought we to be? Hastening the day of the Lord. It's a pivotal moment. We might think about Abraham. That's a pivotal moment. The father of the faithful come out. Right? As we think about that idea, and we think about Abraham and Isaac, it's a pivotal moment in Scripture. All of these are, the right, are good answers to our question. The Exodus... All of a sudden, a new dispensation. All of a sudden, moving from the patriarchal period to the Mosaic law. And all of a sudden, things are going to be written down. <laughs> and you have those things happening all surrounding Moses and the Exodus. It's a pivotal moment. Captivity in the return. After those 70 years were fulfilled, and then they come back, and they had a job to do when they were coming back. They were to be preparing and looking forward to the time of the Messiah. And so that's why when Jesus comes on the scene, there were those who were looking for him. There were those who were looking forward to the consolation of Israel, those things. It's a pivotal moment in Scripture. And, of course, we look to Jesus himself. And we think about the Word becoming flesh. And we think about the teaching that happened. And we think about Calvary. And then we think about the tomb and we think about what the angel said to the apostles all those years ago. He's coming back. He's coming back. And it's a pivotal moment. It's that, that one is the pivotal moment. Jesus, obviously. That is the pivotal moment in all of history and all of the universe. It is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It is the pivotal moment. But there's, there are more pivotal moments to go even beyond that. Because then we start thinking about Pentecost. And we think about the cornerstone that was laid and the foundation of the apostles. It's a pivotal moment in Scripture. But then we keep reading in Acts, and I think we would have to say that Cornelius and the Gentiles, that is a pivotal moment. It's not going to be only for the Jews, that all of a sudden Gentiles are going to be granted repentance and they're going to be a part of this body as the wall of separation is broken down and the Lord is building what the Lord wants to build the church and it's a pivotal moment now beyond that would you say there are more pivotal moments in scripture and I would suggest I would suggest there are more pivotal moments I think one of them is actually found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 so if you could be turning over there, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and let's just read a little bit. 
and see if this is not another pivotal moment, or if at least it's pointing to a pivotal moment. In 1 Corinthians 12, at verse 28, it says, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And I think that more excellent way, if you've ever studied that passage before, which I hope you have, as you have this transition, as it's moving from the time of the gifts, the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit, those miraculous gifts, and we're moving to the more excellent way. That is a huge pivotal moment that at least is being pointed out here. It doesn't happen right here, but it's being pointed to. Right as you have the apostles, the ones with the ability to give those gifts, and then you have those who they gave those gifts to as that generation would pass, and you have all of a sudden the more excellent way being spoken about. And it is an immense pivot, if you will, a transition. And so, we know what's being spoken about. Faith, hope, love. Chapter 13, verse 13, as Paul says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And he goes through it in chapter 13, talking about love, and then the conclusion of chapter 13, and now abide, faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. What we're going to be doing for the next three days, we're going to look at each one of these in each lesson. So tonight, what we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at faith as a Christian. We're going to be sticking pretty much as much as possible to 1 Corinthians. We might bring in a few other verses. But for the next three days, we're going to be looking pretty extensively at 1 Corinthians, looking at our three ideas of faith, hope, and love. We're going to be looking at these because, especially tonight, as we think about faith, we're going to make a few very simple points, and they are going to be very simple. But they are foundational to what it means to be a Christian. Right? I'm, they're going to be simple, but it's, they are going to be absolutely foundational to being a Christian and, and to being the Lord's church. To back up a little bit, there in verse 27 of chapter 12, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So it's foundational individually. It's foundational as the Lord's body, faith as a Christian. So let's go ahead and get into it. And I tell you what, before we go any further, you might briefly just, just think about the issues in Corinth. If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, just in your mind, go through 1 Corinthians. We know how it starts. It's been reported by Chloe's household. There are divisions among you. Right? And there is disunity. He's, he talks about, there in the first few chapters, he says, I could not speak to you as mature. He had to speak to them as babes because they were still carnal. They were, there was still envy. He speaks about that. Okay, so you have the, the divisiveness happening. Then you get to chapter 5, and what had they been doing? They've been tolerating sin. Right? You have the fellow who had taken his father's wife and just... just he says, it's not even named among the Gentiles. And they were tolerating it. They were tolerating sin. Chapter 6, they were dragging each other into courts. They were suing one another. So you could talk about the love of money. Chapter 7, you have a whole chapter about marriage. If you've ever studied what was going on in Corinth, not in the church, but in the society, that's where Aphrodite's temple was. That's where the temple prostitutes were. There was so much going on related to sexual immorality and an, ass and an assault on marriage, it's not even funny. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 7. And Paul says, and we're going to read it here in a little bit, Now concerning the things you wrote to me, <laughs> they had questions about certain things, and those questions are going to be answered. Okay, past chapter 7. You have chapters about liberties. How are Jew and Gentiles going to get along? You don't think liberties is going to play a huge part in that? Absolutely. Chapter 11, you might think about matters of authority in the family as well as in the church. 
Chapter 11 is also, of course, the Lord's Supper. Tarry one for another. Then you get into chapter 12, 13, 14. You have the gifts and everything surrounding the gifts. Then you have chapter 15. That's the resurrection. And there were those who were teaching that there was no resurrection. So Paul has to deal with it. And then you have the conclusionary chapter where he talks about giving in, in, as well as his conclusionary remarks. Okay, I just wanted to go through that. That was a real quick outline of 1 Corinthians. Those, those were some of the issues that were going on. So now we get into faith, hope, and love. First off, faith. Again, simple point. Where is it from and what is it in? All right, let's back up a little bit. Come back to chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, at verse 6. And I hear something popping. Is that anything I can do or? Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, at verse 6. Where does faith come from? Now these things, brethren, I figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. A part of the solution to all of these issues that the Corinthians were having, part of the solution was do not think beyond what is written. Now, granted, it's still being written at this point. First Corinthians, they have the letter in hand. There's going to be a second Corinthians. But at some point, the faith, which is once and for all delivered, is going to be delivered. That's what chapter 13 is about. I'm going to show you a more excellent way. When it talks about what love does, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. Okay, so we have to, as we think about it, learn to think, Learn to not think beyond what is written. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Do not think beyond what is written. This is God's answer to the issues that we have. This is God's answer to questions that the Corinthians had and the issues that they had. And you might look at that because they did have issues. I mentioned that. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is where you see it most clearly. Chapter 7, verse 1, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, they had co there had been correspondence. So they had written to Paul with questions. Chapter 7, verse 1, concerning the things of which you wrote to me. I think chapter 8, verse 1, he says pretty much the same thing. Now concerning things offered to idols. They had questions about this. And it makes sense that they had questions. When you have Jews and Gentiles, and we know what the... Right? We know what each party was doing. And so they have questions. How can we get along with one another when these things are happening? A little bit later in chapter 12, you have another now concerning. Now concerning spiritual gifts, chapter 12, verse 1. So they may have had questions about that. Regardless, like I said, we see it most clearly there in chapter 7. But they had, they had issues, they had questions, and those questions are answered. Where are they answered? They're answered in God's Word. They're answered in what is written. And so Paul says, do not think beyond what is written, as he says, lest they would become puffed up, because they were being puffed up on behalf of one against the other. And so we know what Paul says all the way back in chapter 1 at verse 10, because the only way the unity of chapter 1 at verse 10 happens, when Paul starts the letter, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The only way that happens is by abiding by God's Word. It's the only way that it happens. It's the only way. Anytime folks start getting into opinions, everybody's got opinions. Everybody's got opinions. And the problem is that opinions are not authoritative. The only thing that's authoritative is God's Word. I told you it's a simple point, but it's foundational. It's foundational. Do not think beyond what is written. And so that's where it's from. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. This, it's the only way that our faith is in Jesus. It's the only way. 
to look at verses 12 and 13. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The only way that our faith is in Christ Jesus is if our faith comes through the Word of God. It's the only way. I know it's... Like I said, it's a simple point. But a lot of folks are veering further and further away from this simple point. And that's just the truth of it. Because all you have to do is ask, as opposed to what? Our faith is from the Word of God. Otherwise, it's not faith. And by having our faith from the Word of God, it's in Jesus, as opposed to what? And we think about teacheritis. And you think about what was happening. We look at what was happening here in Corinth and how big of an issue teacheritis was. And that's why we read that passage in chapter 1. I'm of Paul. I'm of, I'm of Paulus. Those things were happening. Why was it like that? There in verse 20 of chapter 1. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? What were the Greeks like? All right, we'll get to the Jews here in a second, but what were the Greeks like? You know, Corinth was not that far from Athens. We have a pretty good insight into what Athens was like because when Paul was there, the city's given over to idols. And that's where the Epicureans and the Stoic, the philosophers, they're just going back and forth, right? They're at opposite ends of the spectrum. And they had so many idols, they even had the idol to the unknown god. All right, so what were the Greeks like? You can take your pick, whatever idol you want. You can take your pick, whatever philosophy you want. You can take your pick, whatever teacher you want. You want Aristotle? Go with Aristotle. You want Socrates? Go with Socrates. You want Plato? Go with, right? Take your pick. Okay? That's what the Greeks were like. Smorgasbord. Take whatever you want. Okay, now what were the Jews like? Well, they would sit in the synagogue, and they would, they would read a passage, and they would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says that, and Rabbi so-and-so says this. What do you think it means? I'm not a big one for stories, um, because stories are not authoritative. But sometimes, sort of like in Athens, you remember when poets says, like your own poets say, you know, and he quotes one of their poets. So I'm not opposed to stories altogether, and this is, for me, it's a good one. I knew a preacher one time. He was a young preacher. And he was living overseas, and he was studying a certain issue. He had come out of denominationalism, and he's studying a certain passage in Romans, and he reads what one commentator says, and he reads what another commentator says, and he reads what another commentator says, because the commentators aren't agreeing. So he sends, and this is how long ago this has been, he sends a Western Union <laughs> telegram, right? He sends a Western Union, whatever you call it, a little blurb, across the pond back to America to his father-in-law, who was also a preacher. And he said, I'm studying this passage, and this commentator says this, this commentator says something else, a third commentator says something else altogether. What should I believe? And the old preacher sends a one-line Western Union back and says, you might just consider the source the Bible. Just look at what the Bible says. Because, it's, because what was happening was very similar to what the Jews were doing. Well, Rabbi so-and-so says, and th says this, and Rabbi so-and-so says that, and Rabbi, which is very similar to what the Greeks were doing. Well, this Stoic teacher says this, but this Epicurean philosopher says that, and this, they're not authoritative. But that's what was happening in Corinth. There's a, a big case of teacheritis going on. And so Paul says, was, was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in my name? I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. Yet each one of them was saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, or I'm of Cephas. We'll come back to that at a certain point in our studies um, this week as well as Sunday. But that's, that's what was happening, and we can do the same thing. We can elevate someone else to the point of authority. We can elevate a preacher to the point of being authoritative. We can, we can elevate an elder to the point of being the high authority. We can elevate man. We can do the same thing. 
we can go down the same rabbit hole. And when we do, it's not faith. It's not faith. And that's, that was what was happening in Corinth. And so Paul's calling them back, and he says, don't think beyond what is written, lest you be puffed up. So you have teacheritis. You also have familyitis. You ask a person, why do you believe what you believe? And what do they say? Well, if it was good enough for Grandma, it's good enough for me. <sighs> right? And we elevate family. We elevate grandparents. We elevate parents. We elevate children. We elevate ourselves, perhaps. The bottom line is, concerning teachers and families, whoever it is in question, I hope they're right. Right? I hope they're right. I hope mothers and fathers are right. I hope grand, grandmothers and grandfathers, and I hope teachers are right. But the things that Paul taught were not right just because Paul said it. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We see a good example of that in Peter in Galatians 1 and 2 when Paul had to withstand him to the face because Peter was playing the hypocrite. Okay, Was Peter playing the hypocrite? Was that to serve as authority for how the church was to conduct itself? No. The things that the apostles taught were not true just because the apostles taught them. They were not the ultimate authority. Who's the ultimate authority? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's also why in Galatians 1 when he's writing to them, and I said I wasn't going to deviate too much from 1 Corinthians, so apologies for that. But when he says, if we or an angel from heaven say anything else, when he says we, what is he talking about? He's including himself. They could not deviate. If they deviated from the truth, then they were just as condemned as anybody else. It's only true. I'll give you another example. The poets that Paul quotes, right? And he says, like your own poets say, for we are also his offspring. Was that true because the poets said it was true? No. It was true because it was true. Because God's word says it, says it was true. And it happened to coincide with God's word. It happened to coincide with the truth. So, simple points. Where is it from? Whom is it in? We have to make sure we're abiding by God's Word. If it's not in God's Word, and, and I'll, I'll put it this way. In my notes, I put it like this. Man, man's wisdom, and man's experiences are not authoritative. And that's the truth of it. But that's what you run into. Sometimes people will say, well, this is what I've experienced in my life. We've all, we've all experienced things in our lives. That doesn't mean it's authoritative. There's only God's word. Faith only comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Anything else, it's not authoritative. Our second point. I want us to, I want us to look at putting faith into, into action, faith in practice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it talks about the need for self-examination in the context of the Lord's Supper. There in 1 Corinthians 11, at verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Later on, actually in 2 Corinthians 13, that idea of examination, it's, it's, it's strong language here in chapter 11. But in 2 Corinthians 13, at verse 5, this is where he puts it even more strongly. I would suggest, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? They were so busy examining Paul, and Paul says, okay, you want to examine me? Okay. <laughs> he says, but you need to examine yourself. You need to test yourself. Other translations use that word of test. So you have that, that concept of self-examination. We know what James 1 says about, about testing of faith. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And it's, it's the hardest thing 
to get our minds wrapped around that the Lord has a way of seeing that our faith is tested. We're talking about putting faith into action, putting faith into practice. And the proof is in the proof is in the pudding. And the Lord has a unique way of seeing that our faith is tested. He always has. All you have to do is go back to the Old Testament. How did the Lord know that Abraham feared God? It wasn't in the good times. Abraham was faithful, usually, in the good times, except for a few instances, like where he lied about his wife. But anyway, but when did the Lord know? When did he say, now I know that you fear the Lord? It was when he took Isaac and he goes three days to Mount Moriah, and he's going to offer Isaac. And the angel stays his hand. And he is full well going to do that. And when Hebrews speaks about it, it says he was concluding that God would raise him from the dead. It was the only thing that made sense. The promise had been made that the seed was going to come through Isaac. Well, Isaac hasn't had any children yet. So if he wants me to kill him, the only way that the seed's going to be able to come through him is he's going to have to raise him from the dead. That is an amazing faith that Abraham had that God would raise someone from the dead. But that's what Abraham had. How did he have that faith? You might ask yourself. Something else had already come back to life. Sarah's womb. All of a sudden, they had a child in their old age. But the Lord has a way of seeing that our faith is tested. Job. Job had good times. And then Job lost so much. Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him. And Job's faith is tested. The New Testament, Peter. There's something to be said about good times. For example, when all of a sudden you have more fish than you can possibly handle. And we know what Peter says, depart from me for I am a sinful man. He had more success than he could deal with. Good times. But then when he's there in the courtyard, and that's where, that's where it's really put to the test. We know you were with him. We can tell by how you're speaking. And there's the test. And Jesus looks at him. And when he thought about it, he went out and wept. The Lord has a unique way of seeing that our faith is tested. What we have to do is we have to be faithful in good times. Sometimes that's hard. <laughs> the proof is in the hard times. That's when you find out. That's when the Lord knows. That's how it's always been in more difficult times. Work backwards through 1 Corinthians. There in chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Concerning the collection for the saints. There's, there's a test there. This is somewhat good times because we know from 2 Corinthians what they were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be preparing to send that gift to the Judean saints. But that was, that was a big thing to come to the realization that they needed to think beyond themselves and think about brethren in other places. So sometimes it's, it's like Paul said, I have learned how to be abased and I have learned how to abound. You have to learn how to do both things. In, in good times, you have to learn how to deal with that faithfully. But then in bad times, that's when it's really put to the test. And I want you to just, as we go backwards through 1 Corinthians, consider how difficult this was, how difficult this would have been. Chapters 11 through 14, talking about the gifts. How difficult would that have been to stop the chaos that was happening in Corinth? You know, some of the things that are spoken about, the different gifts that were actually, these gifts that were given by the Holy Spirit, they were causing brethren to be envy and jealous of each other's gift. Just consider, it would have been extremely difficult to stop the chaos. Gifts and roles... There are things in there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as well as chapter 14 talking to the ladies, for example, talking to the women of the congregation. How difficult was it going to be to rein that in? They were going to have to have faith because things have been going on willy-nilly up to this point 
and it's been chaos. And Paul says, God is not the author of confusion. All things are going to need to be done decently and in order. And at that point, you're going to find out who's going to believe what's been written and who's, one, who's going to just do their own thing. You're going to find out who has faith and who doesn't. Who's going to abide by God's word and who is it? It was going to be extremely difficult to stop the chaos that was happening. In chapters 8 and 9, denying their, themselves in matters of liberty, you have Gentiles who believe, oh, we can eat anything, and then you have Jews who say, nope, we can't eat those things. That's going to be real hard, extremely difficult to deny yourself. When Paul talks about this and another, this here in Corinthians as well as in Romans, and he talks about if eating meat offends my brother, I will never again eat meat. Now we're talking about the dietary laws. We're not just talking about if someone's a vegan or a vegetarian. All right, we're talking about the dietary laws. Dealing with Judaism, dealing with meat sold in the market for the Gentiles, things like that. But that's a powerful statement. Here Paul is, and Paul says, all things are lawful for me. All things are lawful. But he says, but if it offends someone, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to use my liberty. I'm not going to do something that I know God says I can do if it offends a brother. How hard is, how hard is that? That's hard. <laughs> because we are adamant about we have our rights. Right? This is my right and I'm going to do it. Really? Really? Read the chapters about liberties, and you see that Paul denied himself time after time after time. And then you read the passage where Paul talks about, do we not have a right to bring along a believing wife as the other apostles do? Here is a man who lived without a spouse. Here is a man who could have gotten married and had kids and had grandkids, and he never did, and he did it for the sake of the gospel. He denied himself. You don't think that was hard? You know it was hard. That's what we're called to. That's where you see faith put into action. Whether someone will deny themselves, their own rights, their own liberties. Chapter 7, marriage issues. Like I said, Corinth is where Aphrodite's temple was. A thousand temple prostitutes, that's what was there. That's what some of the ancient scholars speak about. How many wives in Corinth do you think had a right to put away their husbands? How many of those husbands do you think had visited Aphrodite's temple at some point? Oh, they could have had rampant divorces. <laughs> rampant. And so Paul writes. They have questions about marriage because of the things that were happening in society. And so Paul writes. And the, the point of the lesson is to not all of a sudden take a tangent into, mar into marriage issues. But my point is this. How hard are marriage issues to deal with? Who You find out who has faith, who's going to abide by God's word, and who's not. This is where it's put to the test. And then we have chapter 5. Come back to chapter 5. And the things that were happening there, in verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Verse 3, For I indeed is absent in body, but present in spirit have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, this was a church matter, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now what's the point? As we examine ourselves and as we put ourselves to the test... And we have to ask whether or not we are putting faith into action. Whether or not we're, we are practicing what Scripture actually says. How hard is church discipline? Man, that's hard. It's, hard. it's hard on a church level. It's hard on an individual level. When the Lord speaks about it in one of the early places that talks about the church there in Matthew 18, go to your brother. If he hears you, you've gained him. If he doesn't hear you, take one or two others. 
If he doesn't hear them, bring it before the church. If he doesn't hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. What the Lord was doing, he was using a figure, the heathen and the tax collector, that they fully understood. Other verses that speak about that same issue. Here, one of them is here in 1 Corinthians 5. Elsewhere is in Thessalonians and other places as well. Keep no company. It speaks about that. It uses that language. Keep no company with them that they may be ashamed. No, we don't count them as an enemy, but we admonish them. Now, how hard is that? That's hard. You find out who actually believes what God's Word says. Right? The proof is in the pudding. Because what a lot of folks do is, when things are good, that's when they believe. When things are hard, hmm. There's a passage, a friend of mine, one of, his, one of the passages he's mentioned numerous times recently in Jeremiah, where the people come to Jeremiah and they say, talk to the Lord for us. Whatever the Lord tells us to do, we'll do it. Jeremiah says, okay. And he goes and he talks to the Lord. And the Lord says, don't fight against it, right? Don't do it. And Jeremiah comes back and he tells them what the Lord says. And what do the people do? No, nah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> That's too hard. That's too hard. Well, you don't believe then. All these things up on the screen and so many others, they're hard. But here in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, look down. He uses a word there in verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That word sincerity reminded me of what Paul, when Paul was writing to the young preacher Timothy, and he talks about the sincere faith. The sincere faith. And that's what we have to have. Not a hypocritical faith. Not, not faith just when times are good. But we have to put faith into action when things are very, very difficult. And this is why edification is so important. It is, this is why it is so, so important. Come back to chapter 12. Come back to chapter 12. At verse 29, chapter 12, verse 29, in that list, pardon me, verse 28, as it says, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. If you could bring any of those gifts into today, which one would you bring? If you could bring any of those gifts into today, which one would you bring? Just look at that list. And this is, it's, it's a little bit of a test. And I think it's a good one. I hope it's a good one. We'll see. I know which one, I know which gift the Corinthians focused on. They were, they just loved speaking in tongues. That was, <laughs> that was their gift du jour. That's what they, that's what they pursued. And it would have been amazing. That would have been absolutely amazing. If you could understand it, I suppose. And that's, you have verses that speak about that. That's why there was a need for an interpreter. But that was their choice. But what would your choice be? What would your choice be in looking at that list? Just out of curiosity, did anybody in here pick administrations? <laughs> did anyone pick governments? I think that's how the other translations do that. Did anyone pick that one? No. Oh. <laughs> how about teachers? Anyone pick that one? I won't ask for a show of hands. A lot of folks, I think, would go for the gift of healings. So many sick people. So many sick people. Can you imagine having the gift of healings? You know, when you remember the verse where it talks about unusual miracles done by the hand of Paul, so that just handkerchiefs that were in his possession and people were healed. Just amazing miracles as people were healed. I think most people would choose the gift of healings. But the reason I think it's a good test is because 
even on that side of the pivot, even when the gifts were in effect, Paul told them which one to pursue. Even when the gifts were in effect, which one did Paul want them to pursue? And that's chapter 14 at verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. That was the gift he wanted them to actually pursue. And I don't fully understand exactly how that pursuit worked. But why did he want them to pursue prophecy? Why did he want them, of all the gifts... Of all the gifts, why pursue that one? And it's because of verse 2 two and on. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Edifies the church. Why is edification, both giving edification and receiving edification, being built up, building others up and being built up, why is it so important? And the answer to the question is, it's because faith is so important. That's why. You can have the gift of healing, that's fine. Lazarus was brought back from the dead. He was brought back from the dead. You know what he was still going to have, you know what he was still going to do again? He was going to die again. Lazarus was not the first fruits of the resurrection. The widow's son was not the first fruits of the resurrection. None of those who were raised from the dead were the first fruits of the resurrection. They were all going to die again. They were all going to have to face death again. So do you think they understood? It's like, yes, it's a wonderful thing, the gifts of healings. It's a wonderful thing. The gifts of helps, the varieties of tongues, those are wonderful things. But why pursue prophesy? It's because faith is so important. Without faith, we know what Hebrew says, without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who, right, we know what it says. Without faith it is impossible to please Him. Whoever comes to Him must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. How many people, if they were healed of their physical affliction, how many people do you think would come to believe? You would like to think they all would, but what's the truth of the matter? Hmm. And so, we think about why Paul says, of all the gifts, this is the one. This is the one he wanted them to pursue. Faith is so important. Not faith in man. Not faith when it suits us. Faithful to Jesus through thick and thin. Built up and building others up. Come over to chapter 16. Built up and building others up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 at verse 13. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. What an amazing contrast. Verse 13, all, it, it sounds like you're speaking to a soldier, doesn't it? But then verse 14, you, you see love, and we'll speak about that Sunday morning. But for now, just key in on verse 13. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave and be strong. That is what the Corinthians had to do. That is what we have to do. Saw someone post something on Facebook just yesterday. Someone who's left the church. Two people who've actually left the church. And they were basically becoming each other's echo chamber. And they were talking about how as they grew up, and they both grew up in the church, and that when they came to realize that being a Christian didn't mean fighting against the world. That being a Christian didn't mean didn't mean always doing what was right. That being a Christian was more accepting the world. And we simply say, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave and be strong. 
put on the whole armor of God because there are enemies of the cross. And the devil, the devil is more than happy to appear like an angel of light. And people drink the Kool-Aid all day long. They just do it all day long. And we have to fight the good fight of faith. This is what the Corinthians had to do, and this is what we have to do. And I would suggest it's what Paul had to do. I'd like to leave tonight reading from the book of Acts. When Paul was in Corinth, through the lens of that passage, stand strong in the faith, be brave, watch. In Acts chapter 18, there Paul is in Corinth. And this is why I say even Paul had to do these things. Paul had to watch and to stand strong and be faithful. Acts 18 verse 1, after these things Paul prepared, Paul, pardon me, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and pursued both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garment and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered a house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there, he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he says, watch, stand fast, be strong, be faithful. The Corinthians had to do it. We have to do it. And Paul had to do it. Whenever the Lord says, do not be afraid, that's a pretty good indicator of what the person is feeling at the time. Paul was afraid. And what does the Lord say? Be strong. Just teach the word. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Just preach it. And find out. Find out. Paul would see, as it says, and many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. All Paul could do was to teach. Preach the word. And you find out who believes it. You find out as they turn from their sins and they're baptized. Now Paul's going to remind them of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus. But what an amazing passage. What an amazing passage. As we begin our study of faith, hope, and love. Very simple points. But this is foundational to what it means to be a Christian. The lesson's yours. If you're here tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, do what the Corinthians did here. The good ones. The good ones. No, I shouldn't say the good ones. We're saved by grace. Bottom line is, who's saved? The good ones? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know what Paul says about himself. By God's grace, I am what I am. And that's what the Corinthians were going to say as well. They had to learn it. They had to learn what it means to be a Christian, and we have to do the same thing. By God's grace, we are what we are, and so we walk by faith. We hear the truth, we abide by it, and if you're not a Christian, be baptized. Be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight and need to respond, please come while we stand and sing.